Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to start by acknowledging that we're meeting on the traditional territories that were shared by the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Huron-Wendat peoples over time, and I'm grateful to be able to meet with you uh, on those shared territories today. Uh, I've been asked to talk about um, how I got involved in uh, equity and what our organization does, so I apologize to those of you who've heard me talk about LEAF before, but I really want to give you a sense of what our organization is about um, because it's really what we live and breathe is trying to achieve what you call equity and what I call substantive equality in, in legal speak. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, LEAF was started uh, in 1985 when the equality law provisions of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms came into effect. Uh, they came into effect three years after the Charter did because the government was supposed to spend those three years getting rid of all the um, straight up discriminatory laws in the country that still persisted. They didn't quite succeed. Uh, we thought we uh, would um, be able to assist with sort of the first few years and then our job would be done and off we'd go. Uh, it didn't work out that way. But the women that had uh, started our organization had been very engaged in the uh, debates leading up to the um, uh, 1982 Constitution uh, to get really fulsome wording into the, um, into the Charter of Rights about equality. So sections 15 and 28 are the equality guarantees, and there's very fulsome wording about equality in those provisions because they realized that under the old Bill of Rights, what we had was that first slide that you saw uh, and what, what I call formal equality. So formal equality is when you treat everybody the same. Uh, substantive equality, though, is what we wanted, and that is where everybody uh, has the same opportunity and ends up um, with the uh, um, with with real equality um, and what you call equity. So I'm I'm sorry I don't use the same terminology, but I'll uh, I'll try to explain a little bit. What was the terminology? Substantive equality. So. Under the Bill of Rights, uh, when there was a pregnancy discrimination case, the judges on the Supreme Court of Canada said, as long as we treat all pregnant people the same, that's equality. So we called that formal equality. And we said, actually, uh, most pregnant people are typically women. And so, <laughs> you, <laughs> so you actually have to accept that uh, there's going to need to be some provision and accommodation in the workplace for women who are pregnant so that they can still access employment. Um, so when the um, uh, Brooks case came up against Canada Safeway after Section 15 was in effect, LEAF intervened in the case uh, as a friend, essentially it's like a friend of the court, so we're not a party, we're not the uh, plaintiff, we're not the defendant. We ask to go into the court and say, we have a perspective that uh, you need to hear because your decision isn't just going to affect these parties, it's going to affect women more broadly in society. And we want you to take into consideration what we have to say so that you'll do the right thing with this decision and not knock us back to the pre-1982 wording of the uh, Bill of Rights. And so the court did listen to us, thank goodness, and they determined that in fact there need to be some accommodations um, to, uh, <laughs> Apparently, there's some grumpy ghosts around. Um, but we were fortunate to succeed in the court uh, in that case and in many others uh, in the early period of the Charter and through into the 90s. So we were able to show the court that, for example, sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination and that uh, if you go into hospital and you're having a baby and you're deaf, you may need some additional assistance um, that uh, just treating you like any other patient is not going to achieve equality. So the Eldridge case in the mid-90s was a case where a woman was giving birth to twins. She was uh, a deaf woman and she had no interpretation and she was in a situation where she just didn't know what was happening and nobody could communicate with her and it was totally terrifying and she had a very, very difficult labor and birth, uh, birth of her children. And we said, um, it's an obligation of the government to provide health care to everybody 
And that will mean different things for different people. And in the case of deaf women uh, during childbirth, it means they need to have some interpretation in the, uh, in the hospital available to them. Um, we also were very engaged uh, in um, working towards protection for sexual assault complainants. Um, so defense counsel used to be able to introduce the sexual history of uh, sexual assault complainants in the courtroom. And uh, we worked very hard to ensure that there were protections for uh, women who uh, were sexual assault complainants because they are not represented in a criminal case uh, prosecuting their um, uh, 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 prosecuting their sexual assault. Uh, there is the Crown bringing the prosecution and there is the defense counsel for the accused, but the complainant does not have a role in the court. So we worked very hard to ensure that there were protections for women making sexual assault complaints. And we did that all through uh, the 90s and into the the last decade as well, more recently um, with a complaint um, um, by a woman with uh, intellectual disabilities, um, we uh, were able to achieve some groundbreaking uh, changes to the law to ensure that um, such complainants have equal access to justice. Also a woman who um, wanted to wear her niqab while testifying, uh, we intervened on her behalf to say that uh, she ought to be able to uh, testify wearing a niqab uh, because otherwise she wouldn't have access to justice. Um, there have been um, a number of other cases that we've worked on that have really uh, uh, produced systemic changes in how our law operates. And uh, so we're sort of little known and little seen, but we um, have been very strategic in terms of how we've used our very limited resources in order to make a difference uh, in how our law applies across the country. So we recognize that it's one thing to have a law in the books uh, that, is, um, that looks very good in terms of equality, but that it's another thing to um, see it in operation and uh, that always there is more work that will need to be done, especially when you have male-dominated courts and male-dominated prosecution systems and male-dominated defense bars. Um, these things are slowly changing, but um, in the meantime, there's a lot of work to be done. Aside from litigation, we also engage in law reform and uh, in public education. So we also um, make submissions to parliamentary committees, um, to, um, we produce shadow reports for uh, holding Canada to its international legal obligations in the human rights arena. And uh, we've contributed to a blueprint on a national action plan on violence against women. Uh, we're a very active member of the Legal Strategy Coalition on Violence Against Indigenous Women. We've been calling for a national inquiry for some time, and uh, we are hopeful that one will soon be uh, um, at least underway. Uh, we're very concerned that they get it right, of course, so we're working very hard to try to ensure that happens. In terms of public education, we have three uh, main workshops that our branch uh, volunteers deliver across the country to high school and university students and community organizations. Uh, one is called Leaf at Work, and it teaches um, people about their rights in the workplace, particularly with respect to um, sexual harassment. Um, but also pay equity and other uh, workplace issues. Um, our very popular uh, Only Yes Means Yes uh, workshop is um, about consent and sexual assault. Uh, it teaches people um, about sexual autonomy, about um, what the law says. Uh, the legal standard which we helped to create in a case called Ewan Chuck in 1999 that the Supreme Court decided that um, there is no such thing as implied consent um, because we told them there is no such thing as implied consent. Um, only yes means yes, and that is the legal standard today, and that's what we teach in our workshop. We've also developed a reproductive justice workshop that we're hoping to roll, roll out in the new year. Um, we understand that in order to have um, uh, reproductive rights, you have to also have access to employment and housing and education and all the things that make it possible for women to make a choice about whether they want to have a family or not and how to go about um, controlling that. Um, is it something I can adjust or is it? Okay, all right. 
So um, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I could go on. Um, but in brief, uh, the answer to the question, are we there yet? Mm -mm. 